John. Hey, what's with everyone else? Hey, welcome. Good to meet you. You too. Um, so, like a little bit about what we're doing. Um, we were just chatting about it. So we're driving from east to west coast, um, trying to raise a bit of money for Neva. Um, the reason behind that was I, I interviewed someone from Neva during COVID, um, and they told me at the time that probably 85% of the membership was saying that we're going to maybe go under without some federal assistance. And that gave us a shock when we did that interview because obviously these venues are so critical to everything. So that, that's a bit about the background of what we're doing. But as we come through town, like each city, we just wanted to talk to some owners. Sure. Uh, learn a bit about the owners themselves and why you do what you do um, and a little bit about the venue. Okay. Um, so I was going to start with, you started baking cookies at your grandfather's shop, right? And then I was just looking at a bit of your background on LinkedIn. Yeah. And then the year later, like after you finished that, you bought, or oh, you became the owner of Blondies. 1989. 1989. Yeah, yeah I was 20 years old. So what, what, what was the driver behind buy, like buying into a music thing? Well, no, I, I, I was a musician. Yeah. You know, from 14, 15, we had our high school band. Yeah. Then I was wanted to move to Hollywood, LA. Da, da, da. Then I was going to clubs and I'm like watching all these guys that are like way better than me. I'm like, man, you know, and I always wanted to find some kind of business. So that I came across Blondie's mm -hmm. metal rock and roll punk bar in Detroit. Like, wow, this is right up my alley, man. Yeah. I love doing music, you know. I never did go out to LA or Hollywood because I wasn't that great, you know, I just did it for fun. Yeah. And bought the place when I was 20, put the liquor license in my mom's name. You know, because I, 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 you, yeah, you had to be 21, you had to be 21, yeah. Then my brother was the bartender, he was 19, and we just had a blast, man, it was great. And it was an iconic venue, right? Yeah. When I looked at the history of it, there's a lot of pages dedicated to the history of that bar. Sure. So like, what a, what a big part of the neighborhood. Yeah, it was like the CBGBs, yeah. the Roxy Whiskey of yeah. Detroit, you know? And you're from this area, right? You're I am, from yes. this area. Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. So then, then Blondie's... You, you own to 94. You bought Token Lounge here in 93? 94. Oh, 94. No, 93, but yeah. it took me a year to open. So Christmas of 94 is when I opened. Okay. It took me a year to open. And then was it was it the intention to run both of them? Or did you know when you no, bought my, the No, my lease was out over there. Okay. And uh, I wanted to get out of the city. It was kind yeah. of rough. It was a rough yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> it was a rough neighborhood, man. And th this venue, so this was already, because I think it, this was found in like 71? 71, 71 yeah. but it was shut down for a year or two. Okay, you took it while it was... Uh, well, it when it was closed, closed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I called the owner mm. and I said, hey, you know, I'm looking at to buy the token lounge because there's a phone number on the building. Mm. He says, listen, man, I've closed on this place three, four times. What experience do you have? Because I always sell it to somebody who doesn't have band experience, somebody who doesn't have bar experience, somebody who's partying too hard, yeah. and I keep getting it back and keep proposing <laughs> yeah. on it. I'm done with it. <laughs> says, well, I've owned Blondie's for five years. What? Blondie's? You're my guy. <laughs> I'm flying in because he lived in Baltimore. Yeah. He says, I'm flying in next week. I'm like, okay. Then we met and we just boom, did the deal, yeah. you know? And then Bl did Blondie's just close at that point? I or closed someone, it. You closed it. Because it was like someone. four or five miles down the road, so it was like close the competition over there. Yeah. Close that chapter. Yeah, close you know, that one. Move, move whatever I was doing over here. And then did things get going pretty quick? Were you booking yeah, shows? Yeah, off the bat. Yeah, yeah. Right off the bat. Because I guess people knew you from, already acts would know you from Blondies. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. Yeah. And was it, I mean, I was looking around the walls when we came in. So was it, is it primarily like when you started? Have you seen sort of a change in the kind of bands that come through here? Or um, do you aim for anything? For, well, back then I was doing a lot of punk rock, hardcore, thrash metal, death metal bands. Yeah. Then I uh, brought that here too with more of a mainstream band. So I was kind of mixing both. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But then in the last five years, all that metal, all that screaming, you know, heavy stuff, I, I kind of I grew that. Yeah. And I'm doing, actually replace it with blues. Yeah. Blues, classic rock bands. Yeah, so Jimmy Bourne as well. Yeah. 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 And th there's a lot going around. Like blues, I feel like, is having a little bit of a, a resurgence. It is. It? Yeah. And it's great living in Chicago for some of that stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so you're a musician yourself. Have you ever, do you ever play here? I, <laughs> <laughs> I live here, I just want peace and quiet, man. <laughs> I want to hear no distortion, nothing. Yeah, yeah it's really, uh, I, uh, like, I was always interested, like, coming around and doing these interviews, how many owners would say, like, oh yeah, I was a musician when I was younger at this, because 
like I I play music, but I mean, yeah, I'm the same as you, right? Like you see people who do it professionally, and I interview people for the website now, right? And it, and we'll interview people at home sometimes, and they'll come in and play. I'm like, holy shit! Like just watching these guys play. So. But there's one thing that yeah. I now I know. I mean, in recent mm-hmm. years, you know, that I've kind of figured out is like. Because I was always into the Evening Mom's Team, Joe Satriani, yeah, all the yeah. Shredder guys. Yeah. Tony McAlpine, Vinny Moore, and all those guys. And I wanted to be like that. Then that's what I was trying to, you know, be like. Yeah. But those aren't the biggest acts. No. The big, biggest acts are three chord, yeah. simple songs with yeah, a good yeah. harmony, melody, yeah. chorus line. Yeah. Those are the biggest. So I could have been that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I never thought simple and easy and melodic and mainstream. That's, and that's where it's going at the minute. I mean, we, uh, I was talking about this actually in the other interview. Like when we came from the UK, I didn't know any of that real country singer songwriter stuff. Yeah. Until I came to the US, it, it was there, right? I just was never exposed to it in the UK. And I started listening to some of that stuff over here. And then I remember probably like two, three years into being here, we came in 2011. I was on YouTube and I just caught, I was like, oh, who's this guy, Jason Isbell? And it was him doing like a, some radio show, mm-hmm. recording, and I saw him and that was it. And I was like hooked on him. I was like, God, this music's amazing. Like sure. he's telling all these stories. And then I went back and found all the other guys who'd done it before him. And it's, yeah, that kind of music. Yeah, story you, don't have yeah. to, you don't have to be a prodigy no. on, the, on an instrument to do that. There's a real genius to being able to tell Yeah, it's the lyrics like and songs yeah. that people can relate to. It's yeah. Work, so. Yeah. No, that's great. It's nice. You the the first, I was talking to Kathy, um, a grog shop, and she wasn't a musician. I was like, uh-huh. I'm sure everyone's gonna want, like be frustrated musicians yeah. who bought. Into but I still book all those Shredder guys. Yeah. I enjoy it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those prodigy know, guys, I love doing those. Some shows. of those guys, it's great to watch. And yeah. then some of them, we were talking about that as well, like Steve Vai and those guys. They're interesting because yeah, they're super technical, but then they write great music. As they well. do. Like yeah. they make it sound good. Um, so I wanted to talk, actually I wanted to talk a little bit because the other thing that's super interesting about you is that you've also been an actor and a director, producer, writer of movies. Yeah, I did it. I yeah. did it for a while. I did it for, for uh, 10 years. And, it was just and, so- and, and you know what's interesting is I did it at, uh, I started my movie in 2000 yeah. and did it to 2010, producing, writing, acting. You know, I got like 35 acting credits on internet movie database. Yeah. And uh, then when I finished my movie in 2010. My friends, when I was 16, were saying, oh, you always want to do a movie. You always talk. I said, what? <laughs> when I was 16? You no, know, I didn't remember. Yeah. So it was kind of, back then, I was kind of scrambling in yeah, my brain. Yeah. I wanted to do a movie. And it was like my bucket list thing to yeah. do. It was an action movie. Man, and, this just gave you, and this gave you the chance to do it? Like, yeah, it did. Because you had the platform here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask you a little bit as well. I mean, the venue's great. What was it like um, during COVID? I mean, how did you cope? Uh, during that that shutdown period, did you did you do other things like we were talking? I think Grove Shop was selling T-shirts. They thought about putting on some parking lot shows. Did you do any of that stuff? Um, I also own a banquet center right oh, behind yeah, yeah, right yeah. the banquet facility, and we were working seven days a week like zombies, man, sixteen yeah. hours a day. So for me, it was kind of like. This is a break. This is a break, man. We need yeah. this break. Yeah. Now we're feeling human. <laughs> yeah. We're having three meals a day. Yeah. We're kind of, you know, socializing. Me and my girlfriend together, hanging out more. So we kind of felt normal. Yeah. Uh, then. So we, I kind of enjoyed it. Yeah. We closed in March. Fifteenth. Yeah. John Crappie was the last show I had, and we were debating on should we do the show or not because yeah. the governor was shutting the state down the next yeah. day. Yeah. Said, oh, let's do it. So we did the show, and that was my last show. Then in July, we opened up in 2020 for two weeks. Yeah. Then we got shut back down. Then rescheduling shows again. Then we opened up in October for two weeks. Then shut back down. Then we're not rescheduling anything. Yeah, that was the frustration. The agents were tired of it. We were tired of it. <laughs> and now we're like, now it's getting kind of too long. You yeah, know? yeah. And we did, we did in, in Chicago, I remember we went to, we did a couple of those shows just when, as it started to open back up, I remember we went to see Davy Knowles at, um, yeah. at the City Winery, and it was just weird, man. It was like there were, the tables were all spread out. Yeah, you all have a mask on. Yeah, so we, we were all that. like at a distance, and it was just. But but I missed it so much. Yeah, like, it, that was the thing. I think. I mean, you as an owner, obviously, were suffering financially. I think 
all the fun. Yeah, we were doing the six foot distancing and the yeah, masking yeah, yeah. and all that during those two week periods. Then we opened up in 21 in February and 100 cap, 100 yeah. capacity. So I'm calling these bands and say, my schedule is wide open, man. I got yeah. nothing booked. So I call tribute bands yeah. that were doing three, 400. I said, hey man, can you play Friday and Saturday next week? Because the governor said we can open up. Yeah. For the same amount of money to play one night. Yeah. Oh, we can't do that. I'm like, dude, when's the last time you played? <laughs> yeah, just played. A year ago? <laughs> yeah. Says, yeah, a year ago. Well, fuck, come and play Friday, set up, do sound check, yeah. leave yourself there, come back Saturday, play. It's 100 cap, that's all we're doing. And a bunch of bands agreed. So yeah. that got us reopened with a Come bunch of tribute again. bands at first. Yeah. Then slowly started, you know, reopening. But it was 100 cap. Then I had the Dead Daisies book June 30th yeah. of that year. And it's like two weeks out. I'm like, oh my God, I got 300 tickets sold so far. And it's 100 cap. What, what am I going to do? <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. Then that show was on a Wednesday. Then that Monday, the governor said, Full cap. Oh, I'm like, holy smokes, man. Look, did, you sell, <laughs> like, did you sell it out in the end? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, people were still weary, man. It was a big. Hey, oh, and when I was selling out 100 tickets at 100 cap, and I'd walk out of here, I'm like, bring 100 people here. I'd go to the door, and on the will call sheet, yeah. only half the people would be showing up. I'd be selling 100 tickets, yeah. but only 50 people would be here. Yeah. Because people are still freaked out. It was weird. So it people was... weren't coming out, man. Yeah. Even when we did go full cap for a while there, you know, there was a section amount of people that weren't coming back out. So. Yeah. We went on a trip. I remember the first one I went back to, full room. We went to Austin on vacation. And that yeah. was probably it was like 21 when stuff started opening back up. And um, it just happened that when we were in Austin, uh, Lucas Nelson yeah. was doing some warm-up shows for his big tour. And so Kirst contacted the publicist, she's like, I'm going to be in town, can I come in and shoot it? She went and shot it, it was at Antones, and I went in just to watch the show, and the room was full, and nobody had masks on, and I was a bit nervous at first, and then they started playing music, and I was like, ah, it doesn't matter, I've missed that so much, and it was, I, that, I'll remember that show now for the rest of my life, because it yeah. was like first live music for eight months. Oh, you know what's interesting, yeah. I, I went on a Neva meeting yeah. back in August of that year, what was it, 21, right? And you know, we're full cap now since June 30th. And then I'm, and I'm listening to some venues saying, oh, we're gonna open up, you know, next week or two weeks, and this is August. Yeah. You know, they're gonna open up September or August. I'm like, I'm like damn, I already did like 90 shows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I already did 90 shows. <laughs> and, uh, but half the money I made, a lot of money I made in uh, 19, yeah. I gave back in 20 yeah. to keep the place open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was the thing, it was like a double hit for you guys, right? Because you had, you had all the ticket sales that you then had a refund. Not yeah. only were you not going to have any cash coming in, you had cash going out, I think. Well, I never had that cash. Yeah. That is held by That's, ticket Oh, it's held by the... Yeah, it's held by that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, man, 19 was like the year I worked the hardest in my life, <laughs> yeah. the longest amount of hours, then I gave, man, half that money back or a big chunk of it back yeah, yeah. 20. I'm like, oh, man, I don't think I'm going to do that again. Yeah. So I'm not... I was on seven days, and now I'm doing six. Yeah. I'm basically yeah, I'm still at home on the computer. Yeah, but, I was gonna know. say I bet you're really doing seven. Yeah, seven. but I'm not I'm not gonna work that hard anymore. That's and what, what's it like? So what's it's sort of outside? I'm always interested in interested in like outside of all the COVID stuff. Yeah. What do you what would you say your biggest challenges are running an independent venue? Like what what yeah what do you sort of find are your biggest challenges day to day? Like is it booking bands? Do you have no the, the the biggest stressful part is when you ha need you know 400 people to break even and you only have 200 tickets sold. Yeah. It's like, damn, I'm gonna lose 10 grand this, you know, on that yeah. show or whatever, you know. And is it just, I mean, so. you must get a feel for it, right? Because you, you, do you, you don't book? know how many people yeah, are gonna yeah. show up. Do you I've had a band bring 600 people one time, the next th next time they're doing 300. I'm like, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah, yeah. And do you get, have you got better at it over the years? I no. guess, right? No, a little better. <laughs> it's a guessing game. I mean, for me, it's a crapshoot. I don't know, you know what other people do, but. Uh, yeah, and then I guess uh, final, I mean, I guess, the other thing I've talked about, it's really interesting. I mentioned it with Blondies earlier, but also when I looked online yeah. about Token Lounge, right? It be, what I think is great about independent venues is how they become like a part of a community and then the mythology around them as well. So there were people who had done blogs about Token Lounge talking about all the hair metal bands and the, yeah. and the full metal bands that had played like when it first opened up. 
Um, but also just about this venue and sure. how much everybody loves it. It's um, I, I like that fact how important they become to the community. Yeah. And that must feel pretty good, like owning a place that's yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Most part of that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's it. I think we'll hopefully have a walk around and do, and do a bit of video. Um, you don't need to. Like yeah, yeah, do your thing, man. And then we'll we'll put that up first. But thanks so much for taking the time. My uh, pleasure. To chat about it. Thank, Thank you so much. much.